Our reading from Luke today comes from the very beginning of his gospel and then jumps to chapter 4. Luke tells us he wasn't an eyewitness, but gathered his information about the life of Jesus and wants to present it in an orderly sequence. He addresses the gospel to Theophilus, which is Greek for lover of God. Is he addressing a particular person by that name or lovers of God in general? Well, we just don't know. The reading moves on to chapter 4, which is Jesus' inaugural address of sorts in Nazareth, his hometown. So Jesus comes home and he goes to the synagogue. He seems to have the role of lector this particular Sabbath, so he's handed the scroll. He opens it to just the right place and reads from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. He not only proclaims the ancient scripture, he is using Isaiah's words to tell the people who he is and what he stands for. But as soon as he connects the spiritual message to one of action for the people, they become very uncomfortable. The people were eager to hear about faith, hope, trust, their history, and what God does for his people. But then Jesus goes further and talks about a spirit-filled mission of putting that faith into how they should live and act as a community. Well, that's something else altogether. The full gospel message has two dimensions, the personal and the communal. In today's second reading, Paul uses the ingenious metaphor of the body to show how this unity is created out of our diversity. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. So we, in our wholeness, are the goodness of God, the presence of God. As individuals, we participate in that wholeness, and that is holiness. It's our connectedness that makes us holy. The health and the effectiveness of the whole depends on the ability of each part to function according to his or her gift. Collaboration is the key to Jesus' mission. Peter calls this union, this wholeness, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people set apart. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God. Paul calls it the body of Christ, and John speaks of a mystical union where we are one. So Jesus rolls up the scroll and sits down and says, this text is being fulfilled today even as you listen. He is saying, this is what I stand for. This is my platform. The people in the synagogue are not so enthusiastic now. We will hear in next week's gospel that they sent him packing. What were they expecting? He hadn't done a whole lot yet. He's been baptized, he's gone into the wilderness, and he's just become his ministry. But they were expecting something. Is the congregation in that Nazareth synagogue all that different from us? Don't we all go to church expecting something? We expect to hear a good homily. We expect to sing some nice familiar songs. We expect to be welcomed and to see people we know. But do we go to church really expecting the Spirit of God to actually show up? Do we expect news so good that it might shatter the way we think or look at things? And do we really want that to begin with? Or would we rather just receive a little comfort, a little encouragement, but nothing that will challenge us too much or rock our boats? Many of us, I expect, think coming to Mass will help deepen our personal relationship with God as it should. But that per personal relationship is just the beginning. If we don't carry that relationship through to see the implications of it, well, then the gospel loses its meaning. There is a vertical connection between us and the divine and our personal relationship with God, but there is also a horizontal connection to each other. If we put both these dimensions or relationships together, the horizontal and the vertical, we form a cross, 
the symbol of our faith. And when we do that, we put our faith into action. When they got up for that morning for synagogue, the people of Nazareth weren't ready for the presence of the Holy Spirit to come in with their small town boy made good. It does make you wonder about the phenomenon of expectation and what it means in our faith lives. Do we go to church looking to have our expectations met? Or do we come here to be filled with the Holy Spirit who inspires us to go out in the world and meet God's expectations of us?